We're going to go today to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13. That's where we'll start. I know that typically on Easter that everybody wants to preach about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and that part of it, but I want to, I want to take a few steps before, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16, and this is, what, this is a discussion between Jesus and some of his disciples. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist. Some say, Elias. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want you to understand that in this conversation, Jesus knows what's coming. He knew what Good Friday was before Good Friday was a thing. He knew that Good Friday was good for everybody else, not for him. You got to think about that. We call this last Friday, we call that Good Friday, but it wasn't so good for Jesus. It's good for us because it, it marks the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's, it's salvation for mankind, but Good Friday wasn't good for Jesus. It was good for us. It was his gift to mankind. We're here to celebrate the resurrection today. But Jesus knew that there would be a church to build, a torch to carry for generations to come. He understood that that when he was having this conversation with his disciples, when he was was planting that in their heads and and delivering this concept that we're talking about today, he understood that, yes, there would be a death, burial, and a resurrection. He understood that the stone would be rolled away. He knew those things were coming, but he also knew that there would be a church in Canton, Missouri, that in 2022 on Easter is going to have yet one more service he knew that there would be more generations after those disciples and he had to make sure that what they needed to know that they had he need, they needed the, those necessary components to make sure that the church survived and he's asking his disciples what are people saying about me who do they think that I am And they answer with various names. They think you're Jeremiah. They think you're Elijah. They think you're John the Baptist. They think you're this reincarnated prophet. All these different names that they throw out there, uh, people that are tied to, to biblical history. And he asks them, okay, who do you say that I am? If I say, who do you all think that I am? You all have an answer for that. But if you ask one of my children, who's he? Well, that answer is a lot different. And so he's asking his disciples, who do you? It no longer matters what the crowd says. Now I'm asking, who do you say that I am? That was the question of the day. Did they get his message? All those teachings, all those dinners, all that time walking down the road, all the traveling, all of the things that they did, all of the miracles, all of the signs, all of the wonders, everything that they watched him do, was it enough to really get the message across? Did they understand who he really, did they really understand who they were walking with? It's the question of the day today. Do we really understand who we're walking with? Who we're talking to? Who it is that did what he did for us? And Peter, the the apostle that preached Acts 2 before there was an Acts chapter 2, confidently answers, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you skip down to verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. It, it, this isn't something that Simon, P- Simon Peter came up with on his own. This was something that was a revelation from God himself. He says, it, it, uh, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, and, that means that this is, these two verses is one single statement here. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock 
I will build my church. We, we often confuse and say that, that, that Apostle Peter was the cornerstone of the church at that point, but it's not. What Jesus is referring to, if you look at the English language and you look at it, uh, what he's referring to is not Peter himself, but he's referring to the revelation that Peter just demonstrated for the crowd. Here's the part that I want you to get this morning though. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is what you got to understand. Peter is not the rock. The revelation is. Peter understood that the guy that he was following, the one that he was walking with, talking with, sitting down to dinner with, he wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't an acquaintance or a good friend. He wasn't a transient, but he wasn't a politician. He wasn't rich, but he wasn't poor. Who was this man, Jesus? And Peter had the revelation, I understand. This is Jesus Christ. This is the Savior. This is God manifest in flesh. And Jesus tells him, this is the cornerstone of your... That revelation, knowing who Jesus is... That's the revelation. That's who he really is. That's the tipping point on the scales. You may come in here with all kinds of problems, but once you have that revelation and you know who Jesus is, you know whose side you got to be on, you know what it takes to win, well then all of a sudden, the scales change. The situation changes. There's a catalyst that's introduced and that situation is no longer a losing situation. When you know who Jesus is, when you call on that name, when you understand that you have an advocate with the Father in Jesus Christ, the last part of that verse though, that gives us a reassurance that you can't buy with money. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Again, I promise not to be too long, but I, I, I bring this and present this to you this morning. We may be here to celebrate our bright pastel Sunday, may be here to celebrate in our bright pastel Sunday best, but hell this morning is in mourning. We might be here to celebrate, but hell is in mourning. We just came back from youth convention in St. Charles, and I'm telling you, it was a great youth convention. When those, when those kids heard the gospel preached and they made their way to an altar, hell was in mourning at the loss of the kids that are no longer in hell's grip. When 2,260 kids packed in on a Friday night when they could be doing anything else. But they packed in for a service so they could worship God one more time. Hell is in mourning. I love it, but when Deshaun was filled with the Holy Ghost, hell is in mourning at the loss of that one. When we launched Cahoka a few years ago, with just one family and a small team of volunteers, hell got nervous. When you see it today and you understand the crowd that has gathered, the lives that have been changed, the investments that have been made, hell is in mourning today. When we have a Wednesday night jam and none of you adults are allowed in here, but this place is filled with little kids listening to my daughter and, and jumping around and, and worshiping God and playing games and all of that stuff and all of the adults are in class. But when we have a jam and all of those little kids are in here, hell is in mourning. One more time the gospel is preached and one more time hell feels the pain of loss. When we have yet another service where the presence of an almighty God sweeps through here and changes lives, I promise you it's at that time that hell is in mourning. When people really learn forgiveness for themselves and for the people that hurt them and we understand how good God is and how quick he is to forgive and how just he is, hell is in mourning. When we see the handiwork of God all throughout our community in the northeast region of this state and beyond, 
Hell is in mourning. I, I, I've, I've talked to missionaries this week and I've talked to other friends across the district and they tell me all of these good reports. Uh, we have two other churches in our section that right now are in the process or have been in the process of buying new buildings because they've been expanding. Their congregations are growing. I'm telling you, when you have reports like that, hell is in mourning. Jesus tells his disciples on this rock, on this revelation, I will build my church. And you have to know who he is. Jesus Christ, our Savior. At one point, if you read further on in Matthew, now we're going to get to that crucifixion part of things, yeah? You read further on in Matthew, you can read the account of the crucifixion. And hell thought they won. They watched as his mother cried. They watched as his followers fled. And they watched as he died on that cross after uttering the words, It is finished. As the stone was rolled over the entrance, the cheers from hell so loud because they thought they won. But in three days, Three days. Three days. What a beautiful resurrection morning as the stone was rolled away. I can't drink sweet tea from the pulpit. Three days, the stone was rolled away. And you know what was happening then? Hell was in mourning. I'm going to tell you, today... The tears are starting to fall. Hell groans from the pain of loss as one more time we have a chance to approach this altar and receive a touch from Jesus. Jen, I told you I wasn't going to be long today. I'm going to tell you, I don't know what kind of hell you brought in here this morning, the things that you fought this week and how hard it was for you to get here. I can only imagine, but I have. I know that for some of us it was easy. We had our outfits laid out. We got up. We might have ate a small breakfast or something, had a cup of coffee, get dressed and leisurely make your way to church. But I guarantee you that there are some here under the sound of my voice that you had to deal with all kinds of things before you walked in this place. What are people going to think about me? Is this the place for me? You have no idea what I've been through this week. Maybe I shouldn't even go. I don't even know if I'm going to be welcome. Do they have place? Do they have room? Do they have a place at the table for me at that church? I'm here with news of a God that can touch your life, restore your broken pieces, fill you with his spirit, and save your soul this morning. You may have had to really fight to even get through the door. You may have been nervous or anticipating what people would say when you walked through the door. But today, hell is in mourning because you're here instead of anywhere else. You may be wondering if the Lord has room at the table for you. But I promise you, He's here and He's calling you today. And He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He wants to change your life. He wants to restore your marriage. He wants to set you free. There's deliverance and restoration in this house today. Why? Because of a, of a sacrifice that was made some 2,000 years ago for each and every one of us. And today it's free and it's for you. You may have fought hell to get here, but hell's in mourning today because there's an altar that is now open and ready for you to come and make a life change. If you'll all stand, I want to open up these altars today. Hell is in mourning because you have an opportunity. Hell is in mourning because they're about to lose yet again. We can look and say that this world looks dark. It looks bleak. But I promise you, hell is feeling the losses that it incurs every time that the Lord decides to move through His people. This altar is open. I ask you, everybody that will, everybody that's able, to come and, and let's talk to Jesus for a few minutes. 
Let's find restoration in Jesus today. Lord, I praise your wonderful name. God, I magnify you today. God, you are great. You are wonderful. You are mighty. God, I thank you for your Holy Ghost in my life. God, I thank you for your touch on me today. God, I thank you for what you've done in my church, in my family, in my children. God, I thank you today for everything that you've done. But God, I know, I know, I know that today you are the answer and you have the answer for someone else's life today. The most beautiful I praise your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus.